So this next part is our survival panel, which is probably my favorite part. Um, and I actually, I think I know a majority of the five that are coming up. Um, so I want to start calling out your name, if you could please have a seat. Suzanne, Shelly, Jonathan, Oscar, and Patty. start the panel, um, I wanted to show you guys a video that some of you might have seen already, but I think it, it captures the essence of the young adult narrative, the young adult story, and it's a good sort of uh, aperitif to the stories you'll hear uh, right now with these folks because I, I keep saying this over and over again ad nauseum, but the young adult cancer story isn't special. It's no more special than anyone getting cancer, but it's different and we have different needs, we need to thought of, be thought about differently. And the way in which we get busy living may be a little different than the way in which other age groups choose to get busy living, like six-year-olds or, or older Americans. So I, over the last six years since this young adult universe has begun, um, I, I can think of no better sort of cultural uh, example of how this generation is really mobilized for themselves and their cause and their caregivers than our annual big conference, which is called the OMG Cancer Summit for Young Adults, now entering its sixth year. We're going to be going back to Vegas at the end of April. Um, but I, the, the video from 2012, which was just off the hook, was insane. We had 552 people from 48 states and three countries uh, just come to the Palms Casino for two and a half days of, of something that had never really happened before. So this is that, and I just wanted to share it with you. OMG Cancer Summit for Young Adults, Kenny Kane with Stupid Cancer. It's the largest patient conference for young adults with any type of cancer. 550 people. 550 people. Stupid Cancer! What we're doing has never been done before. And that's why this is such an extraordinary moment in history. I learned so much. I, I learned that, you know, for as different as we all are and all the different diseases that we have, we're all the same and we're all dealing with the same emotions and I'm just so, so grateful to be here. I looked at them and said, are you guys pulling on my catheter? <laughs> and then they looked down and they were both knocking their foot against the, the, this jar of urine. When stupid cancer first approached Volkswagen and said, hey, do you guys want a partner? We knew that we had the opportunity to really be part of something special. I loved OMG. My name is Stephanie, and I am a caregiver here celebrating with uh, my partner, who has CML. And I love the community. Everyone has been so welcoming. Workshop workshops were fantastic. I'm here to support the OMG Stupid Cancer Movement for Young Adults, because patients who are going through cancer that are young have special needs. Our organization partners with Stupid Cancer on events like this because it's so powerful for us as navigators to see that there's someone out there that actually cares about the young adult. OMG Cancer Summit is amazing because it's the largest young adult conference. You're going to find the most people here with all kinds of different needs. It's not just for one specific type of you know, cancer, like brain tumors or breast cancer. It's for any cancer, any young adult, which, you know, it's a group we're targeting. I'm the CEO of Young Survival Coalition, and this is my first OMG conference. I'm thrilled to be here because young women can and do get breast cancer, and uh, it's important. I want to make sure.
sure that every young woman that's here uh, that has breast cancer knows about YSC and knows that she's not alone. My favorite part has been, it's a tough one, maps and the gatherings at nighttime. I say it's a multiple places. I say it's a place last week when I checked in, they gave me a key. A key, not a key card, a key. I was like, oh my god, I got a million to the car. So that's the young adult cancer movement. And we're here today to have five extraordinary people share their stories and describe what it's like to have gone through this at their age, to understand their place in this world, and what they did and how they chose to live uh, with, through, and beyond their challenges. As we close this up, OK, there you go. So uh, let's just start at the end and uh, take two or three minutes. Let's, let's, uh, let's do this. Hello. 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 Um, my name is Oscar Lorena. Um, I'm 25. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 18. Uh, it, was, um, it was winter of 2005. I was dorming. Uh, I was in college. Uh, you know, regular 18-year-old, you know, just having, you know, good time in college. And then all of a sudden, I go home for winter break. Uh, my mom noticed that I was pale. She said, oh, you don't look, you know, you don't look your regular color. And I didn't really pay much attention to it. Um, and then she said, oh, let's go get you checked out. I got checked out. Um, it turns out the doctor said I, I was possibly anemic. So just to make sure we did extra, extra tests and, and came back that I had ALL leukemia. Um, Followed the regular procedures, got, um, did chemotherapy, um, did chemotherapy for a couple of months. Um, I went into remission, and by the following fall, I was actually back in school. And then in two, February of 2008, I relapsed, and this time I went forward with a, a stem cell, um, excuse me, went with a bone marrow transplant. Um, as a result from the bone marrow transplant, I had um, GVHD, which is graft versus host disease, which is basically when your body rejects the transplant that you're getting. And until now, I'm still you know, fighting against GVHD. I'm getting photophoresis treatment here. And hopefully, you know, one day I'll just get over this. And, you know, just keep moving forward. Hi, I'm Suzanne Sinal. I'm 26 years old. The great thing about watching that video is like, you know, cancer when you're young makes you feel very lame a lot of the times. And it's nice to see that people who have cancer or had cancer can feel really cool too. So I like that, especially in Vegas with the Playboy bunnies. And <laughs> um, my story is um, I'm a two time survivor. I was diagnosed in 2008 with acute promyositic leukemia. Um, it was my senior year of college at Rutgers University. And uh, I 
was, it was characterized by having a lot of blood loss. I came to the ER one day, got misdiagnosed several times, and I had lost half my blood. And uh, then I spent a month in treatment. Then I went back to Rutgers the next semester with my wig on and just, you know, kept doing it. Uh, then I uh, was told that I was like essentially cured, and uh, but when I was in my second year of law school at University of Maryland, I was just feeling a lot of anxiety. So I decided to go back to my hemo-oncologist and he did a blood test and he said, you know, it looks like it came back. So that, I had to take a year off and uh, I spent 50 days in the hospital the first time and then I had an autologous stem cell transplant, um, which is similar and different to what Oscar went, to, went through. Um, then I decided to transfer schools and I came, because I wanted a fresh start, I didn't want to go back and have to have people ask me all the time and I just wanted something new and I came to Seton Hall Law School where I'm pursuing a health law concentration and uh, I had a wig and it's so great like having had the experience of being an adult wearing braces you always think someone's going to say something to you and no one ever does but uh, with the wig so many people complimented my hair they wanted to know where I got my hair done you know I just thought I think like most people are pretty oblivious so um, that was kind of great and then I I started dating, too, with the wig on, too. So those are topics I can talk about. Thanks. My name is Shelley Nolden. i 33 years old now. When I was 31, I was five months pregnant and had an 18-month-old baby girl already. Went in for a routine ultrasound, and the doctor informed me that there was no heartbeat. So she sent me to an abortion clinic to have a DNC, and in the basement of that abortion clinic, after I was, you know, tried to be stopped on the way into the building by protesters, I was informed there was something wrong with my blood and rushed to the ER. Five days later, I was diagnosed with actually the same diagnosis as, as Susan, which is how we've become friends, um, and taken in an ambulance to Hackensack because it was viewed as such a good hospital for our rare diagnosis. So I spent around the next 40 days in the hospital grieving the loss of my baby while simultaneously not being able to see the existing daughter I had because of my suppressed immune system. Um, so in terms of, you know, my highlight topics, it's being both a mother with cancer as well as dealing with the issues of not being able to have a child. Hopefully I will someday when I'm done with treatment. And now I'm dealing with my daughter who's asking me to have a daughter, another daughter so she can have a sister. Um, so we have the tiny bad guys discussion. Um, but a lot of what I do to try and cope with this is a writing. Um, I have a blog called Life's a Beach. I've actually had a logo designed, which was a lot of fun and felt like something positive out of this. And I have a literary agent um, for which I'm working on a novel with. So. I'm Patty Pasquino. Um, when I was 36, uh, I was diagnosed with um, invasive uh, ductal carcinoma of the breast and uh, stage two and I was five months pregnant at the time. Um, I did not know that I could have surgery and treatment. Um, but uh, my doctor said for your type of breast cancer it is possible so I just said let's do it and a week later I uh, went in for a lumpectomy, started chemo uh, during my third trimester um, had a healthy baby girl uh, after three rounds of AC and uh, then completed 13 more infusions. Um, was getting ready for radiation when they said, wait, you have another tumor. So and this time it was a little bit of a different one, triple negative. So um, I opted for bilateral mastectomy and um, just uh, went back to work after 16 months of being out on medical leave. My job, thank God held my position for me. Uh, so that was a good thing to get back to work, but also juggling two kids, little ones. They had a, a three-year-old boy and a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, so a two-year-old girl, sorry. So um, uh, once I returned to work, went for an annual PET scan, and that's when they found a thyroid tumor, which um, they couldn't tell me for sure if it was benign or cancerous until they took it out. So went and did that, took a little time off work, Went right back to work. Uh, luckily, it was benign. And um, 
you know, just bracing for that next, next PET scan and uh, also working with a good friend of mine from childhood. She and I, turns out, we were reconnected due to breast cancer, Karen Ryan and I, and um, we decided that we really didn't find the support we needed when diagnosed with breast cancer. So um, we worked with Valley Hospital, Dr. Klein's office, and now we have uh, a group of 50 women registered for the support group. About 20 to 22 women show up each month for support, so it's been, it's been a journey. Uh, good, after, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jonathan Viot. Um, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma two years ago, and uh, I've battled it twice over the last two years. I was diagnosed in March of 2011, just two months prior to graduating from college. Um, and it felt like my w world was turned upside down. You know, it was the last thing I was expecting as I'm getting ready to go into the workforce and out of college. Boom, get hit with cancer. That was the last thing that was on my mind. Um, it went rather smoothly the first, uh, first battle. Um, you heard Dr. Gua talk about it earlier. I went through ABVD treatment um, pretty much from April through October. And in December of 2011, I was deemed in remission. Um, and I was ready to get on with my life. I was ready to move on and cancer definitely changed things for me and I wanted to be able to give back to the community somehow. I wanted to get more involved. And uh, I was happy to say that I got a job here at the John Thorough Cancer Center. I was working in customer service for two weeks when I went back to Dr. Gua and he told me that I had to go in for surgery because we needed to see if the cancer come back, had come back. Two weeks after that, my fears were realized, cancer came back, so I had to go through an autologous transplant, uh, stem cell transplant, where they used my own stem cells. Um, and if I could just say for a moment, one thing that I regretted the first time that I went through it was I didn't take advantage of all of the resources that are available. You, you had an opportunity to see a lot of the resources that are there, whether it's Stupid Cancer, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, the American Cancer Society. There are a lot of different resources that are available. And I did get involved with stupid cancer after my first battle, and I was <coughs> glad that I did because going to the happy hours is really um, a great way to meet people like us and realize that you're not really going through this alone. I know I've see, I see a couple of people here that, that I met there, uh, including some of the people here on the, on the panel. And uh, for those of you who haven't gone and are thinking about going, I, I would definitely recommend it. Um, and one of the best things about it is, is that it's not, it, we don't discriminate. You can bring anybody, whether they have cancer or they don't have cancer. You know, um, my friend uh, Joe, who's here in the audience, actually comes to some of the stupid cancer events. And um, one thing that he actually liked to, to describe the way I went through cancer the second time is, well, John, you had, you had half chemo, then you had your blood taken out, then you had super chemo, and then you had the blood put back in. Well, it's not exactly described that way. In fact, I still don't know what half chemo is. <laughs> but I did go through that. I did have treatment. I had my stem cells taken out, more treatment, wiped down, put the stem cells back in. And on October 2nd of last year, I um, was reborn, uh, as they say. Um, and then January of this year, I was told that I was in remission. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and one other thing, <clears throat> one other thing I would like to talk about, too real quick is um, one thing that I had really fought with, not just with cancer, but also student loans. And I don't know if some of you may have seen it, some of you may not have, I was actually interviewed and on the news with my battle with student loans. And um, one thing I would just like to say to everybody is don't take no for an answer because you're fighting for your life. The last thing you should have to fight over is not being able to pay back loans and things of that nature. And I'm also proud to say um, that I've now seen a great deal of feedback from everybody who has seen the interview and things of that, and it affects everybody across the country. And I've gotten further involved. I've talked to some congressmen, and um, we're really trying to get a movement going to change the policy so that nobody who has a disease, whether it be cancer or anything like that, has to deal with the same problems I, I dealt with, with phone calls nonstop and looking for payment. So we're really making some progress, and hopefully that'll be something that this Congress can actually get done. <laughs> Thank you.
So five amazing individuals, five completely unique stories with significant common threads amongst them, uh, issues that are solely unique to young adults, issues of, were you in high school or college at 18? College. college. You're just starting college. And then it's the gift that keeps on giving, as you're living with it now. Dealing with a career, law school, right? How do you discuss that on your resumes with these gaps? Parenting, two mothers with children. Um, and then financial issues, significant financial issues. And then having to, you know, the potential joking stigma of, you know, blood out, blood in, like how do people relate and understand and how do you communicate effectively with your friends if they stay your friends? I want to first uh, go to Shelley and Pat because this issue of parenting and fertility is unique to anyone largely under 45, young adults. You don't really see a lot of 16 and 7 year old cancer patients worrying about their fertility uh, when they're diagnosed and going through this. And, and just, it is the, I would say, the second most relevant social issue facing young adults outside of the isolation that we all typically feel. But I was hoping, obviously, you have a serious loss through this, but that wasn't precluded by your disease itself. It just compounded everything you were going through, correct? Well, the cancer did the cancer kill was the baby. Well, the can yes. Okay, so there you go. All right, so it was a double, double knockout. So can you talk about what, what, what would you like the public to know about being a mom and going through this and how it's different um, outside of the obvious bit? Great. Right. I, I think that any, sorry to exclude the men here for, well, I guess it applies to men too, but any, any young adult going through cancer, it's kind of a, there's two tough outcomes. Either you can't have children, but there's also difficulties with having children because I attended a First Ascent's um, Young Adult Survivor Camp last summer, and when I got there, there was no other uh, woman there or anyone that had had a child. And so for the week, I do have one child, I felt like I couldn't talk about missing her and being away from her for a week and it reminding me of being in the hospital when I couldn't see her because these women, many of them have lost their, fer in their fertility for good. And well, the men, I mean, it's just easier to, to sperm bank, so you know, many of them can, but it's harder if you're a woman, you don't have time to harvest eggs. And so finally at the end of the camp, you know, I think a lot of these women were looking at me and saying, you're lucky, you had your one daughter. Well, that doesn't take away from the loss I feel from having lost the one. And in doing a lot of research and reading books about miscarriages and stillborns, the conclusion a lot of these materials show is that women only get over this once they have another child. So then how do I fill that hole in my heart not being able to have another child right now? And then also, you know, for women that have, the, have infertility, that's tough. It's also tough being a mom because it's an extra pressure. I need to stay alive for her. I don't want my three-year-old daughter growing up without a mother. And when she's coming to me and saying, you know, why are you taking medicine? And I'm telling her it's to get rid of the tiny bad guys because it's the only thing she can understand. She says to me, do I have tiny bad guys? Does daddy have tiny bad guys? Will your tiny bad guys come back? And so, you know, it's... It's, you have to look at it both ways, and it's like just understanding that everyone goes through this issue, and there are lots of options, and there's lots of resources in terms of other ways of having children and experiencing that, but even if you have a child, it doesn't mean that all the fear will go away because you need to be around for that child. So, and one of the things I learned is that it's not just an issue we face. Many, many women came to me and said, I had a miscarriage, I can't have children, and I found that it's a very silent grief. It's not open in this community. And actually the novel I'm writing um, has to do with a woman who faced infertility. And there's two points of view in the book. It's the surrogate daughter and the father. And the point being that women often don't have a voice about this issue. So one of the great things I think about this group is we understand these issues. We can turn to each other. We, you know, you can, and even men too. I'm feeling bad about this issue and when we can relate to each other. So please, I encourage all of us to reach out and, and connect here and have an ongoing dialogue. Yeah, I mean, um, like I said, I was pregnant with my, my second child at the time and um, uh, the cancer was just loving the estrogen and it was estrogen receptor positive. So uh, I knew after uh, I had my daughter that it would be 
time to take the overs out. And, you know, no more children, but we were okay with that. Um, so now it's just, you know, adjusting to po uh, being postmenopausal overnight and hot flashes and joint aches and all that good stuff that comes with that. So that's on my end of the spectrum what I'm, what I'm dealing with. And, uh, you know, my poor husband there, <laughs> he gets the brunt of that postmenopause fun. <laughs> So, right, so but, well, and, but again, so this is, you know, testifies it. Through. Like this is exactly the kind of conversation that the country needs to recognize and realize. Like we're not special; we're different. Um, to Suzanne and John, obviously, economics. You know, you have debt. You couldn't get a job for a while. You know, managing. The, we 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 joke, like I said before, it's, it's tough enough to be 24 in, in this world to begin with. Throw this on top of yourself when you have significant challenges getting over those hurdles. Um, I want to talk about debt, but I'd love to talk about that gap in your resume thing and how did you get past that and it's another issue that we face trying to build a career. Um, I'll start. Um, I never had, I never had to, I haven't had to work yet. Oh. <laughs> um, been a perpetual student. Um, but I do have that gap in my resume, especially because I transferred schools and when I went on a, a one firm interview, uh, you know, right away, I just had anxiety, they're going to ask about it. So I like addressed it right away saying, you know, I had some, I said I had some familial caregiving issues because I thought that sounded better. So, uh, my career services counselors told me to say family issues or um, personal issues because um, uh, the workers, I mean, the employers are not allowed to ask you about exactly what happened. And um, then going on several two more interviews, I realized that I didn't have to address it because most people aren't looking at time gaps. They just ask, oh, why did you transfer? And I could just say something as simple like, which was true, that I just changed my focus of what I wanted to do from working on Capitol Hill to wanting to be more involved in healthcare in pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. So getting over the anxiety that everybody knows and they're just waiting for you to say something, um, that helps a lot too. And trying to stay more reserved about it too helped. Um, well, just to expand on what I was saying uh, earlier, um, you know, I, uh, getting diagnosed with cancer two months before you're ready to graduate college kind of throws a wrench in the entire works. It, it makes it a lot, a lot more difficult. Um, and the problems that I faced, you know, I went through cancer the first time and the banks were a little bit more forgiving when they first tried to get money from me because I explained to them, you know, I had cancer, I, I didn't get a job right out of college. It was difficult. Um, when they were not as forgiving was when I was re-diagnosed. And what it, they would not give me a deferment or forbearance. They wanted money right away. And what they didn't realize, or I tried to explain to them, and they just didn't want to realize, was I was not working. I had no source of income. So I could not take care of the responsibilities that I had. I could not take care of the loans, and even though I wanted to. And I never said that I didn't want to, and I still plan on taking care of my um, responsibilities, but that wasn't enough for them. So they called my house six to eight times a day, seven days a week, Sunday was not excluded. Um, and it just, it, it got so frustrating. You know, my mom answered the phone one time and she said, my son's recovering from chemotherapy. They said, oh, we're sorry, but they called back an hour and a half later. So, you know, it was just, it was incredibly frustrating and I personally just didn't want to take it lying down. So that's why I contacted as many news organizations as I could. Uh, I was thankful that WNBC did respond and they did a segment and spoke on my behalf, advocated for me, and were able to put things into a deferment and forbearance, uh, at least until I got better. Um, but what really surprised me was, you know, Stupid Cancer put it up on, on their website and I saw a lot of different people who responded to it saying, I had the same issue, Sally Mae said this, Citibank said that, and it's, it, it, it impacts everybody across the country. It's not just the New Jersey problem, it's not just the Jonathan problem. It's, it's everybody who's a young adult who deals with whether it's financial aid for school or other kind of loans. And the fact that the banks won't just have a conversation with you, to me, is unacceptable. And that's why I've tried to reach out and I've gotten some conversations with uh, Congressman Garrett, who represents my district, uh, Senator Menendez of New Jersey, and actually just yesterday afternoon, I, I reached out to other congressmen of other states because it's a nation problem, 
and I'm actually excited that I got a, a response from Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. So hopefully now things are starting to get there, starting, the ball's been rolling, and you know, hopefully through these people that I've made contact with, we're able to get something going and, uh, and make some change because it, it, it needs to happen. We need, we need some help. And, and bravo, bravo for that. I remember, I remember putting it on our, our wall on Facebook, and it, it was one of the more popular posts that month. I mean, like you're like the, the, the Braveheart you know, <laughs> of this movement. You know, like, thank you. No debt, that kind of thing. Karen, question? I had two surgeries, and although I was lucky enough to have insurance, as we know, um, there are a lot of flaws with the system, and insurance companies play games with what they can, what they call usual, an allowance for usual and customary charges, and that's where they play games about what they're going to cover for you, and it is extremely, um, it's questionably legal what they do, and I was left with extraordinary bills that my insurance company was not covering, and I fought and I fought and I appealed and I appealed, and finally at the end of my time that they give you to appeal when, when my insurance company said I've lost, I wasn't taking no for an answer, and insurance companies are hoping and expecting everyone to take no for an answer because it takes tremendous emotional energy physical strength and time to fight insurance companies. At most people give up because it's just too much. You just want to bang your head against the wall dealing with insurance companies. And I was so angry that finally I wrote to the Lieutenant Governor of New Jersey and I, I wrote a, a final letter to my insurance company for my final appeal. And I wrote a pretty nasty letter accusing them of taking advantage of a young breast cancer survivor. I cc'd the Lieutenant Governor's Office of New Jersey. I cc'd the Public Health Advocate of New Jersey. I cc'd the State Health, Com Health uh, Commissioner of New Jersey. And guess what? I had been fighting for a year and a half. The second I made my fight public with our government, my insurance company buckled like that, and I got $25,000 to pay off my bills. Like that. And I got, because they're expecting you to give up. And as soon as you make a threat to go public, insurance companies want it to go away. And they take advantage of everyone. If, if, if I can bounce off that for a second. Uh, one thing that I think uh, we kind of often lose sight of as a society is that these officials in government, we elect them, we put them there. So what they're supposed to be doing is representing our own viewpoints. So if we're having issues, we shouldn't feel sorry or uh, afraid to reach out to them and, and continue to reach out to them. You have to be persistent. Um, you know, with uh, most recently when I've been talking to some of the Congress people and people within their, their organizations, um, the staff members, I send an email and then I, I give it about a week. And if I don't get a response, I send another email. The power of the pen, or however you want to describe it, is truly, truly powerful. And you just can't, you don't, don't be bashful. Go out there, write something, get your, get your voice heard, because that's their job. Their job is to listen to us, the people. And um, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that you were able to get something done. And that goes for anybody. If you're having a problem, voice it. And you'll, you'll be surprised how many people are in the same boat as you are. You're really not alone. Right, and, and actually, you read my mind, Karen, because this would have been the perfect segue, and it is, to health insurance in this country, which affects everybody anyway. But young adults are the age group to most largely be under or uninsured. And even if you have any insurance, you could be in this, this donut hole where they just decide to poke a stick at you and not care and expect you to give up. And I want to open it up to all, all five of you to comment on that. Um, but just, just for, for point of fact, um, we had a guy speak at our conference in Vegas last year called Wendell Potter. And Wendell Potter used to be the exact horrible person at the insurance company that would deny, 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 and help build the campaigns around why we deny and all these. So, and he became a whistleblower. And he wrote a book called Deadly Spin about how Cigna was intentionally holding, withholding insurance from people and people were dying and people died on his watch. 
a young adult survivor died on his watch, and that was the reason why he changed his mind and flipped sides. So he was, he's now this amazing, he's like the, um, uh, who's the breast cancer? Uh, no, 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 the Julia Roberts movie. Susan, Aaron Brockovich. He's the male Aaron Brockovich for health insurance. And he's done so many wonderful things, but he was changed by a young adult story. And again, he went public, it's a big deal now. And he's the kind of guy you could email and say, Blue Cross is doing this to me, and he'll give him a call. You know, so it's, there are people out there that are really on the side. They'll make it public if you can. So to the four of you, your insurance dramas, please. Okay, Matt, just let me start when you guys look back here. Hi, oh, you another question? I know I was denied uh, after the pregnancy and the chemo was completed, I was to get an MRI because I couldn't get it when I was pregnant. And the insurance denied it because they couldn't take into the variable that I didn't have it upon my diagnosis, um, even though I couldn't have it because of the pregnancy. So I had to appeal all of that, and that MRI is what located the second tumor. So uh, you, like Karen said, you just got to keep fighting. And luckily, I had a great medical team to stand behind me and appeal it for me. I actually had the opposite effect. Uh, um, when I was, uh, I'm a patient of Cigna, and I actually had wonderful insurance, fortunately, and I had a nurse advocate, too. And one thing that's really interesting to hear is how, like, cancer has brought about people's advocacy and advocating for themselves and becoming more of an activist. And I kind of like that. And I noticed that with stupid cancer, too. I came here to table, and it was nice. Um, just being part of like a movement and being an advocate. And I kind of took that too with um, working with my doctors at a previous hospital of having to be an advocate for myself because I felt like my care was being mismanaged and that's why I transferred my care here. So um, having that activist role gave me some power, so. Oscar. Um, luckily I haven't had any in insurance issues I have had problems with loans, school loans, and, and I know, and I believe you when you say selling me calls you and they just keep bugging you, and then they, they, they say that you oh they, we have to you have, you have to pay back unless you're gonna go into to default, and it, it's just like they, they try to scare you into it, and I like you said you just gotta keep fighting it because I kept fighting it, kept talking to my social workers, kept sending letters and letters, and finally you know they accepted the forbearance. And then later on, too, they, they, you know, they haven't been bugging me because, it, you know, like you said, you're fighting for your life. You're not, you're not just like taking a vacation and they expect you to pay, you know, money back and you're, you're in the hospital bed laying, you know, getting treatment and stuff. You have tubes coming out of you. Like, what do they expect? Like, uh, but yeah, you know, luckily with insurance, I really haven't had any issues. I have um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and, you know, Things have been good so far, you know. Uh, I have no complaints with the insurance, but you know, it's it's like a one in a million thing, you know, because like I, I I see a lot of people have had problems with insurance, you know. So, like you said, you just gotta keep fighting it. There's an organization called the Cancer Legal Resource Center. It's at based out of Loyola. Free lawyers help you kind of like if they have to be the person that makes it public or when a lawyer sends a letter on your behalf to your insurance company, they really start to pay attention to what you're saying, and they will do that for free. There's also a group in DC called the Patient Advocate Foundation, which kind of does similar stuff. Now, I was just gonna say, does that work also with creditors and credit cards also? Sometimes it does. PAF can help you sometimes getting the letters. There's also something called, it's like the lawyer, it's on our website, the National Cancer Legal Resource something. Like if you click I need a lawyer on our homepage, it takes you right to their homepage. They're the umbrella for the entire country that can direct you to some of the regional areas where you happen to be or where your insurance company is or where your debtor is. So they can help you in certain cases 
write that letter. So when you when you when they call you up, you say my attorney is FedExing a letter to you. You'll have it tomorrow. I expect you to call me to confirm your receipt. They'll start really paying attention to you. And this is the power that we have now. And you guys are very proactive. Did you become proactive, or have you always sort of had these inherent self-advocating traits? Well, that's actually something I want to touch on, that I think the young adult community has this whole separate issue with insurance. Because when you think about children who get sick with cancer and often the elderly, they have somebody in that mid-age range that is responsible for them. So if some, you know, 11-year-old has cancer, their parents are handling the bills, going through all this, or oftentimes also with the elderly. Us middle bracket, we're responsible for ourselves. So the fact that we had this extra burden of having to do these things ourselves, um, when I was in the hospital, my insurance initially denied all my claims saying I had pre-existing condition, which actually is a joke, because if I'd been sick for more than two weeks, I would be dead. But it was hundreds of thousands of dollars of bills. And at least when I was in the hospital, my husband was fighting the insurance company. But then once I'm out, you know, it's back to life. I have to do my job because we have to pay the mortgage. And I just take more responsibility. And now in retrospect, when I look at that extra stress of me having checking all those numbers, paying the, you know, the extra amounts, I realized that a mistake I made was not saying to my husband, please do this for me. I can't handle this because you want to take on more, you want to feel like you're capable of it, you don't want to burden other people, and then it just builds and builds, and you know you either break down or it's just too much. So let people help you with that. Thank you. So just going back to like, you've obviously become like, you're, you're like Mr. Soapbox now. <laughs> were you like this before you were sick? Um, uh, I don't think so. I don't think that I, um to, to an extent, I suppose I was. You know, my, my parents, uh, my parents have always been uh, the kind of people that weren't afraid to uh, to make their opinions heard. Um, my my mother is uh, is Irish, and she has that famous Irish temper. Um, but my dad was also on uh, the school board of education in town, and the fact that they were able to, they weren't afraid to get out there and advocate for themselves, taught me that the most important. The, the most important advocate for you is yourself. So if you're not gonna sit there and give yourself a, a good shake, if you're not gonna be able to uh, support yourself, then how can you expect anybody else to? Um, in regards to my own personal efforts, you know, I'd never really sent out any letters looking for serious responses um, in terms of policies or, or anything like that before. Um, but when you get to a certain point when you're fighting for your life and you know, you're, you're being harassed nonstop. You know, everybody gets, gets to their breaking point. And, you know, I got to my breaking point and, you know, now it's kind of moved on beyond that. Now I want to be able to help people that have the same issue but maybe haven't gotten to their breaking point or are afraid of speaking out against it. So that's why I'm trying my hardest to do something to, to help everybody. You know, I, I believe that there's been a ton of people that have helped me out from social workers to nurses to doctors that have helped me, you know, stand, uh, sit before you right now and be breathing. So if I can then turn it back and, and get some help for everybody else, uh, then I, I think that um, I've done my job. I'm actually a social worker with the National MS Society, so I had a bit of an advantage because I have helped uh, some clients navigate um, health insurance issues. And uh, so, I mean, obviously, each uh, situation is different. So there were still things that came up with my situation that I learned along the way, the tough way. So, um, but it did help to be able to know that uh, I was able to connect with med my medical professional team and get this taken care of. I didn't want to waste any time by calling myself. I just said, look, this is what they need. Let's do this and get it done. Well, we have maybe, I guess, five minutes left or so. And so we can either take questions from the crowd or I, I have a kind of a selfish question, which is, you know, everyone likes to come to, to whether it's LLS or super cancer, and they say, it would have been so nice if I knew you existed when. 
but we're now seeing a lot of people diagnosed that are told about these resources. And I often ask myself, like, where was I when I needed me back in 96? And there was no anything back then, so I can't fault it. But you are part of something relatively new into your, you know, your, your, the club no one wants to belong to. You are actually part of a welcome mat. You know, there's a welcoming committee now in the young adult cancer world, and John Thur and Tamara's Children's are, are emblematic of making that happen on the ground. Can you talk about what, what, what your, were your fears allayed? Were your emotions, you know, perhaps better, I, it's hard to put, like, do you feel cooler, you know, <laughs> that you walked into a club? You know, it's a, again, the club no one wants to belong to, but you're, there's a big thing going on now for us. Just your thoughts. Um, I, I, I guess I feel cooler. Um, <laughs> it's definitely nice to know. Maybe that, not the uh, right word, but we know what I mean. <laughs> it's nice to know that you're not alone. That that's for sure. Um, but one thing, it's it's kind of funny because people say, "Oh wow, you know, you, you had cancer. You know, that 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 sucks. You know, I I hope that I never have to go through that." But um, one thing that I I I I very very appreciative of is the fact that I've gone through this. You know, I've been I had cancer for two years. But the friendships and the relationships that I developed through having cancer, I wouldn't trade in for anything else in the world. You know, um, I even, uh, you know, uh, found my girlfriend who was uh, one of my nurses, um, and you know, I, I've, you know, I've told her she thinks I'm crazy, but I told her I said, you know, I'd do it all over again if, you know, if I was able to get to you. Yeah, I know, a little, a little cheesy. Um, but, but I'm serious, you know, the, the friendships that I've developed throughout all this um, has been phenomenal. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad, not necessarily glad I had to go through it like that, but uh, I'm definitely glad that Stupid Cancer was around and that uh, John Thurow Cancer Center was phenomenal. And uh, glad that I got to meet a lot of you. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just really opened up my eyes to the fact that uh, by meeting people at the Stupid Cancer Happy Hour, thankfully for Tara for putting that together, um, that you know we all have our shit, so to say. So we all have our our load to carry, and um, you know I look around today and at the happy hours and at the support group, and I just I'm amazed by the people around me. So you guys give me strength, and I'm grateful. I think events like this are great for making connections. And then I think one of the great things about Matt's organization is so much is online that it's like my darkest moments are when, I, when I'm home alone. And so that, this community exists in my darkest moments. And so it's nice to be able to make the physical connections and then rely on people who through social media are there all the time for you. So if you haven't checked out the online presence, um, please do so. I'm going to frame that quote. <laughs> Make my darkest hour. Yes, the internet is always there. <laughs> um, I definitely feel like it's a community where you can relate to people more. I know, like, being a young adult with cancer, you feel often very unrelatable to other people. They just don't get it, and they, um, not to their own faults, they just, they're dealing with a different set of issues. And um, you know, it's nice being in support groups too, where you talk about these issues of like, um, especially dating. I've gone to a lot of dating and disclosure things, and you know, you have so much anxiety about it, and then like, it just pushes you to a certain point where you're like, well, I really got to just get out and try it. And then once you do it, then the anxiety starts to wear away, and you find something new to be anxious about. So, <laughs> but you know, you're learning tools at the same time, and it's also great watching other people navigate. Um, these issues and to model yourself after them. Um, I remember when I first, when we first started actually doing a, a young adult group here, because I remember we, we had nothing. It, and I, I remember because I came, I was so young, I came here and there was a giant gap between me and the other patients. I would see, look at the other patients and you know, everyone was much older and I had really nobody to connect with. And I remember um, one time um, during, uh, was it the interns that were here for, for the social work? The social work intern. And I spoke to them because they were, they were interviewing the patients. And I, I remember speaking to, to a couple of them saying, you know, what, what about us? You know, like the young adults, like I haven't seen any. Like, and they told me, oh, there, there's a couple of them here. 
and I said, I've never seen them. <laughs> and and I, I, I suggested, why don't we you know, get a group together so we can meet up, maybe have you know, stuff to talk about. And you know, slowly it started coming together. And they, I remember our first meeting, like I was the only one that showed up. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, it's like little by little, and then I met Suzanne, and then you know, met Tara, and then like, Little by little, we got we got into the whole stupid cancer thing, and then it's just like like it's it's here now, you know. It's amazing. So it's yeah. Maybe one more question. I was just gonna say, I mean, I view all of you guys as rock stars, like I do my wife. Uh, oh, you have to. You have. <laughs> <laughs> I have no choice. <laughs> but I just want to say, from a husband's point of view, from a family's point of view, the you know darkest days we were always together but knowing that there's outside sources that are there like you guys uh, meetings to go to it keeps her it keeps her grounded it keeps uh, it, it keeps her faith up it keeps her going it keeps her advocacy going and I couldn't do it without you guys it, it was really a blessing for me and my family and the caregiver is always the forgotten stakeholder in all of this and we could have a thousand hours of conversation and dialogue about the caregiver. Um, really, you're the ones that made things happen for us. And, a lot of thanks. Yeah, and so thank you to the caregivers. I, I think we're out of time, but thank you to the panel. Oscar, Suzanne, Shelley, Pat, and John. Um, and any final? Oh, one comment from the back. In the narrative, in the story, is really all the power. And everybody has a tremendous story to tell and very inspirational for me. It keeps me grounded and it keeps me doing what I do. And I thank you for the privilege of being involved with you because I've been involved with many of you and hope to continue um, throughout. But I think together, you're united and you give each other strength. And that's, that's the bottom line. People need to connect with people. That's why we're here. That's why we have this building, and we just want to keep it going. So thanks for everything you all do. Tara, come on up. Tara Crawley gets the biggest round of applause yeah. right now. And this is the first of many of these. Don't don't worry. Yeah, there'll be more events, yes. and make sure you sign up for our email list if you haven't. So you know when we're doing more things. I could just have one more question. Though. Yes, sure. Sure. Yes, sure. Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> to headaches. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah, I mean, again, we could talk for hours. I think there's a significant amount of resources and support here at Hackensack for you to connect you with other teens and other high school students. And I mean, even Oscar, who was 18 at diagnosed, can totally relate um, to what that was like. I was 21, I was in college, but the, the needs of the teenagers are definitely separate from the needs of the young adults. But we're all part of this not children, not older adult community. And we just band together. So you're more than welcome here. No one's going to throw you out for being in high school. Trust me. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.